Good evening. I'm Chris Jansing. Day 381 of the Biden administration. More than a year after the insurrection, Mike Pence makes a seismic public break with his former boss. This afternoon, in remarks before the Federalist Society, the former vice president finally and firmly rejected Donald Trump's repeated false claims about Pence having the authority to change the 2020 election results. It was an extraordinary moment, as Pence recalled the violent siege on the Capitol. He went on to forcefully rebuke the man whom he devotedly served for four years. January 6th was a dark day in the history of the United States Capitol. Lives were lost and many were injured. But thanks to the courageous action of the Capitol Police and federal law enforcement, the violence was quelled, the Capitol was secured, and we reconvened the Congress that very same day to finish our work under the Constitution of the United States and the laws of this country. And I heard this week that President Trump said I had the right to overturn the election. But President Trump is wrong. I had no right to overturn the election. And I had no right to change the outcome of our election. And Kamala Harris will have no right to overturn the election when we beat them in 2024. Look, I understand the disappointment many feel about the last election. I was on the ballot. <laughs> but whatever the future holds, I know we did our duty that day. He was referring to a statement Trump sent out over the weekend that claimed, quote, Mike Pence did have the right to change the outcome, and they now want to take that right away. Unfortunately, he didn't exercise that power. He could have overturned the election. Pence's comments today came just hours after the Republican National Committee voted to censure two Republican lawmakers for taking part in the House investigation into the January 6th attack. The RNC says both Liz Cheney of Wyoming and Adam Kinzinger of Illinois, quote, engaged in actions in their positions as members of the January 6th Select Committee, not befitting Republican members of Congress. The censure resolution goes on to say, Representatives Cheney and Kinzinger are participating in a Democrat-led persecution of ordinary citizens engaged in legitimate political discourse. Remember, that assault on the Capitol led to the deaths of five people and left 140 members of law enforcement injured, some of whom have said they thought they too would die that day. Cheney, who is the vice chair of the select committee, responded to the censure vote with this social media post, writing, this was January 6th. This is not legitimate political discourse. Late last year, Cheney said the panel was planning to hold several weeks of public hearings. Today, another member shared more details about the timeline and what they hope to uncover before then. They have sandbagged us enough that it has slowed down um, the scheduling of hearings, and I think it's more likely to be end of April or May. I want to make sure that um, every substantial subplot to overthrow the 2020 presidential election is fully investigated. So um, we really just learned about um, the, the subplot campaign to seize election machinery which is real banana Republican stuff. The focused campaign against Mike Pence is something where we have a lot of information, but not complete information, and we're hoping to complete that. So, I mean, the, the, you're right that there, you know, there's no exact finish line, but we do need to investigate. The panel has also learned more about a phone call between Ohio Republican Congressman Jim Jordan and Donald Trump on January 6th. A source tells NBC News that documents turned over to investigators by the National Archives show the two men spoke for 10 minutes on the morning of that day. Back in July, Jordan was vague, elusive, when asked if he'd spoken to Trump the day of the insurrection. On January 6th, did you speak with him before, during, or after the Capitol was attacked? Uh, I'd have to go. I, I, I spoke with him that day after, I think after.
I don't know if I spoke with him in the morning or not. I, mean, I, I just don't know. Uh, I'd have to go back and, and I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know uh, th that w when, when those conversations happen, but, um, uh, but uh, what I know is I spoke with him all the time. Jim Jordan is one of three House Republicans invited to appear before the January 6th committee. So far, they've all refused to show up. Last night, committee chairman Benny Thompson indicated members were having significant discussions about possible subpoenas. Today, Jim Jordan was asked about that. Would you comply with a subpoena if the, well, if the we'll committee does? Let's we'll see what the committee does. We're also following the current administration's efforts to navigate its domestic and foreign policy agendas. And there was surprisingly good news on the jobs front today. The U.S. added 467,000 new positions last month, defying expectations that jobs would be hit hard by the Omicron surge. And the November and December employment reports were revised to show many more jobs added in those months than previously reported. That America's job machine is going stronger than ever. This morning's report caps off my first year as president. And over that period, our economy created 6.6 .6 million jobs. 6.6 .6 million jobs. You can't remember another year when so many people went to work in this country. Meanwhile, the crisis over Ukraine escalates amid reports that at least some of the more than 100,000 Russian troops on Ukraine's eastern border have now been put on their highest state of readiness. And today, Russia's Vladimir Putin and Chinese President Xi Jinping offered a show of solidarity and a challenge to America's role on the world stage. The two met in Beijing ahead of the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympics. It's Xi's first in-person meeting with a foreign leader in nearly two years. Both men then issued a lengthy statement opposing NATO's expansion. While that meeting was taking place in China, newly deployed American troops from Fort Bragg, North Carolina, began arriving in Eastern Europe to help support America's NATO allies.